Hi, everyone. Uh, so this talk is called Secure Python Development, Tips, Tricks, and Tools. Uh, I'm Dominic Delabrere. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I thought I had Red Hat under software engineer, but I think that disappeared somewhere. Um, I work mostly... <laughs> I, I work mostly on um, internal tools and um, and internal processes within Red Hat. So um, what I'm going to present to you is not a project. Um, it's not really even anything new exactly. What it is is a summary of things that you can uh, that you can get started with if you want to bring some secure development practices into your Python projects. Um, this is just a summary of uh, what I've discovered as part of a team working on trying to make uh, our coding more secure, uh, and particularly in an environment that uses a lot of Python and uses a lot of uh, CI CD. So uh, I'd like to lay a few ground rules. Uh, the first is that uh, I'm not the security police. I'm not the Python security police. I can't tell you what to do. Uh, I'm not your mom. <laughs> so anything I say here is uh, uh, advice from my experience. It's not uh, the law. Uh, security can only be improved, not perfected. You've probably heard it before if you've um, read anything about security. But uh, it bears repeating that anything here is not going to make uh, your coding uh, <coughs> perfectly secure. It's only going to maybe help you get to that, that next step of uh, a more secure environment. Uh, also, I'm going to mention a number of tools here. You'll see logos for different projects uh, that you can use. Uh, they're not really endorsements. Uh, these are only the tools that happen to be familiar to me, um, and they're here as examples. Uh, so I'm not recommending one thing over another necessarily. I'm going to focus on a few different areas for secure Python development. So first, I want to focus on secure dependency management, um, basically how to know that you're pulling in the right Python packages and um, formalize that process. Uh, secrets management, um, because like any software project, a Python project can have um, a dependency on credentials, API keys, et cetera, and uh, Python has particular ways that you can manage those safely. Uh, static application security testing, or SAST, um, again, this is not uh, unique to Python, but Python has a unique way of um, uh, interacting with SAST. Um, some basic network security reminders around Python and uh, how to enforce best practices in Python coding so that you have a, a common starting point for a secure development in your Python project. So here's the Python package index. Uh, I think well, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I like the Python package index. I like being able to pip install things. It's very nice. Uh, but there are some security challenges around uh, that model of installing software uh, and uh, adding dependencies to your project. So uh, the challenges we have are isolating Python packages from the system-wide Python. Uh, making sure that the library versions match across different environments. This is a, a challenge for everything, but um, uh, obviously one Python environment could have different library versions from another, so that's another challenge. Vetting package releases before trusting them in your application, just as you would in any other language that has its own package management system, uh, but we have particular tools for that uh, in Python, and uh, verifying Download integrity, just the basic making sure that you are downloading uh, in uh, a verified package, uh, mitigating against um, so-called man-in-the-middle attacks, et cetera. Uh, so in terms of isolating packages from the system-wide Python, uh, the, the very basics that you likely have heard already are like, uh, please don't use sudo pip install. Uh, 
on the uh, on your main <laughs> system. So instead, you want to be using a virtual M. You've probably heard that uh, they've been around for a while, uh, but it bears repeating. Um, but it also helps to use Tox uh, to provide dependencies. Uh, Tox is a, a great system for um, running all your unit tests in one place and in a predictable way. Um, but it can also provide kind of a front end to various other things that you might be doing with your Python application or Python scripts. Uh, it provides a very reproducible way to uh, install dependencies uh, right when they're needed uh, into a temporary environment and uh, tear them down when you're done. Um, so that's good for lint checks and unit tests, but again, lots of other stuff you can run with talks. Um, you may also want to consider something more comprehensive than Tox. Uh, there are whole Python packaging systems that will integrate that kind of uh, dependency management. Uh, so those include Hatch and Poetry. Those have both been recommended to me. And we definitely want to make sure that library versions are matching across different environments. Um, Tox, for example, takes uh, requirements.txt uh, often. Um, a requirements.txt doesn't have to have versions in it. You could just be writing the names of uh, packages, and uh, that could result in inconsistencies. Uh, one thing to help with making sure that you have the same version everywhere uh, across different development environments is uh, pip tools. Uh, pip tools is a project that has basically two main uh, utilities in it, pip compile and pip sync. Uh, pip compile converts a requirements.in file to a requirements.txt file. So in a requirements.in file, you can be a little bit vague. You can say, uh, I want requests, but you don't have to say what version of requests that you want. If you're uh, OK with it, having a strategy of pulling in, say, the, the latest available version or the, um, the current default. Uh, and a really nifty thing about that pip, uh, pip compile is that you can pass a generate hashes flag to it, and it will uh, compute checksums uh, SHA-256. Um, so a nice uh, secure hash that you can use to validate those uh, requirements when you're pulling them in. So later, when you run pip and install all of those, it's actually checking um, hashes uh, as it downloads the packages. Um, the annotate flag is also very useful if you've got this in a shared project and you want to see where a dependency came from because you know uh, you install requests and then it pulls in something else. Uh, there are certainly packages with much deeper dependency chains. Uh, so annotate will show you how you ended up with that dependency in your project in the first place. Um, pip sync is the other command that's in the pip tools project. And that will update your virtual env um, to help you keep those packages fresh. Um, so this is a smaller solution than one of those full packaging solutions that I mentioned earlier, like Hatch or Poetry. But it helps you manage the dependencies uh, in a similar way. Uh, of course, as with any language with a package uh, manager, you want to be vetting the package releases that you are using them before you trust them. It's really simple, but again, uh, just asking the basic questions. What other projects are using this package? Who maintains it? Uh, do they respond to bug reports? You know, how active is this project? Uh, and you can be checking change logs to see what's coming into the project, what new features are in there. Um, to help you with checking those dependencies that you have, uh, there are dependency scanners. So the example I chose for this presentation is called Safety. Um, Safety will scan your project for dependencies uh, that have known vulnerabilities and uh, tell you how to remediate it. So if that means that uh, there's an upgrade without that vulnerability, it can, it can uh, recommend that, or even if there's like a, a small downgrade that um, reverts that uh, vulnerability, it can recommend that as well. You can uh, integrate it into a CI-CD pipeline. Uh, the thing is, this is um, 
this is a, an open source project, but um, it's on a model where uh, for non-commercial use, you can use their free database. It's uh, very good, but for any kind of commercial use, uh, their license asks that you, or, or requires rather, that you uh, buy an API key from the, um, the, the developer be behind Safety, which is a uh, PyUp. Verifying download integrity is um, pretty easy once you've got a tool like those package managers I mentioned earlier, or um, or uh, pi uh, sorry, pip tools. So uh, there are specific suggestions that uh, the pip team has for verifying download integrity. Uh, the first is that you use pip instead of running a setup.py. Uh, setup.py is uh, arbitrary code that you're invoking. I mean, you could read it first, obviously, but um, uh, it's considered safer to use pip uh, these days because um, it does more than just running the setup.py. There are certain checks involved. Um, you can pass a require hashes flag to pip, uh, and that will verify the downloads using those hashes that you added in with the pip tools. Um, and you can, you can use the only binary flag that's recommended. Uh, so if you um, run the only binary flag, it will pull in binary packages instead of pulling in the source package, um, which means that it will simply place the files where they need to be instead of running uh, setup.py, et cetera. Um, so this is kind of like an extreme case. Uh, this is a lot more work, but if you have an environment where you really need to place a barrier be between yourself and PyPI, there's the option of caching PyPI. You can have um, you can have your own mirror of PyPI. You can vet everything that comes into it, all the updates, um, and you can choose what you approve and what you don't approve. Uh, this is just one example of like uh, an enterprise uh, solution that one company has proposed. Uh, they call it Nexus Repository. Uh, I just provided that as an example, but I should also mention, you, you may have seen the table for a project called Pulp <laughs> lying around. Um, so that's another example of like an open source project that's um, out there trying to provide various ways of mirroring different kinds of repositories, not just PyPI, but um, other sorts of repositories as well. Now, like anything, uh, a Python application might need passwords, keys, certificates, tokens. These are all secrets. They're things you keep secret. Uh, the obvious thing that you probably have had drilled into your head for years is uh, don't hard code secrets into your Python, <laughs> Python source code. Um, uh, but also don't store, uh, don't store them in secrets. Uh, sorry, don't store your secrets in source code management. Uh, there are private um, source code repos, obviously, but really no source code repo was ever meant to hold secrets. They're, they're meant to share things, not to, not to keep things secret. So um, if you really have to store secrets in SCM, because I'm not the security police and I can't tell you <laughs> not to do it, then at least use Gitcrypt uh, Git crypt, so that all the secrets are PGP encrypted. Uh, Gitcrypt is a transparent process that you, uh, it's a plugin for Git. So um, once you integrate it with uh, GNU PG, uh, it will use your uh, private public key pair to just transparently encrypt any secrets that you're adding into, uh, into the project. It's a little more complicated that, uh, than that on a project with multiple developers. You have uh, probably multiple keys from your team, um, but it will, handle, uh, it will handle the math essentially of using all of those keys to, um, to encrypt the secrets so that any one of your developers can then go back in and decrypt them. Um, but that will probably make revocation uh, harder <laughs> if you ever have to do that. So um, rooting out plain text secrets uh, in source code management also has some tools. So some examples are uh, projects called Detect Secrets and Git Leaks. Uh, you run these. Um, either locally or in a CI CD pipeline, and they 
uh, they scan your project and say, hey, this looks like an API key um, or a password. Uh, often uh, it's scanning against lists of known uh, credential formats or uh, it might do a little bit of entropy detection. But um, either way, the idea is to point out these might be secrets and you can either mark that as a false positive or you can take it out of your um, source code and uh, obviously revoke that secret. You don't want it <laughs> live anymore. So uh, anytime it's possible, uh, instead of using a source code management for your secrets, you want to use like an actual secrets management system um, if you're sharing that with a whole developer team. Uh, HashiCorp Vault is the big uh, commercial example out there. Uh, I had mentioned it here because it happens to have uh, good programmatic uh, access to secrets. And the way you can do that in Python is with uh, HVAC, the, uh, the Python client for HashiCorp Vault. Uh, that's a community supported uh, client. Um, so it's not an official part of um, uh, the supported HashiCorp Vault system, but um, it's good and it's out there. Um, but moving on from secrets, uh, we have security linting. Uh, there's a good chance you're already linting your code for style, but uh, a security linter does something similar where it builds an abstract uh, syntax tree from your code. Uh, a style linter will usually throw up an error if it uh, notices that your code isn't syntactically valid, uh, uh, and then move on to style checks. Security linting, instead of uh, going into style checks, will go into uh, security checks that will look for common security issues. Uh, a good option uh, for security linting is Bandit. That's open source. Um, again, run it locally, run it in CI, CD. But it uh, just looks for common security issues in your Python code, uh, including things like, for example, uh, you've run a shell command uh, with a subprocessor or whatever, um, whatever like standard library uh, function you've got in Python for running shell commands, and you've just thrown a variable in there. Uh, this will throw out an error, and you have to decide if it, if it really is uh, a security vulnerability in the context of your project. So for example, you can mark this as a false positive if uh, what you're developing is uh, a tool that developers run on the command line in their own environment, and they're allowed to, to give input that is going to uh, go right into a shell command. Uh, they're just doing it on their own system. That's not really uh, compromising security. Or, for example, you're already uh, thoroughly sanitizing variables that you're putting into your shell command. You can say, well, uh, it's not a vulnerability here because we've thoroughly uh, sanitize these variables. Um, but maybe it is a vulnerability. Maybe, uh, maybe you're taking user input from a web application and putting it into a shell command, and then uh, you, you'll want to fix that instead. Um, so static application security testing can kind of pull all of these things together. Uh, there was a great talk uh, earlier in the conference about effective SAST, so I won't repeat all of that here. Um, but the examples that were given there used mainly SEMgrep, which is, uh, which is nice. It's, a, it's an open source uh, SAST tool. Uh, the example I decided to provide here is uh, SonarCube. Um, so this is kind of an open core uh, type thing that you can use for SAST. Um, there is a community uh, supported open source version of it, and then there's a, an enterprise uh, version that they sell. Um, it does use uh, it does do all those dependency checks that I talked about that you can do with something like safety, but it also uh, performs the security linting and it provides you with what are called code smells. So if you're not too familiar with um, SAST, a code smell is essentially something that is um, maybe just not best practice, um, not necessarily a security vulnerability, but something that makes your code maybe um, more prone to errors in the long run. So for example, the uh, first time I started using SonarCube, I got some code smells about, um, about strings that were, I was repeating, string literals that 
repeated a few times in the same piece of code, and it said, hey, this could be a constant, which I hadn't thought of, and um, I just went and corrected that. Easy to do. Um, it will also pull in your unit test uh, coverage met uh, metric. So if you're running PyTest, uh, maybe you're running PyTest through Tox, or you're running some other system that runs all of your unit tests, um, it can take the output metrics and parse them. Um, and a wonderful thing about it is it, if you're integrating this into CI CD, um, then it's going to be able to focus on just the code that's changed in a mer uh, merge request or pull request and uh, tell you what percentage of that new code is covered or um, how many code smells are in that new code. So for gating, that's, uh, that's very good because you don't, have to, um, you don't have to filter out a bunch of false positives on, off the bat. You can just focus on uh, improving the code that you're checking in now. <laughs> um, so you can start adding um, better formatted, more secure code uh, now and gradually improve the security and formatting of your overall code base. Um, and you can set up, I, th I think you sa I said you can set up gating, um, but anyway, that's basically just, you've got a percentage, right? Uh, I need uh, this percentage of coverage, or I need uh, a certain, it needs to be under a certain threshold of code smells in the new code, et cetera. Um, but this is, again, just one example. I, I like it uh, for this presentation because it does integrate with like PyTest uh, coverage and things like that. It will, uh, it will, tell you uh, how those metrics apply to your code, uh, your pull request. So uh, basic network security reminders. Again, nothing new. Uh, please use TLS. Um, so anytime you're interacting with APIs, uh, you really want to be using HTTPS um, uh, rather than HTTP as your prefix. <laughs> you want to be um, you want to be using that uh, certification. And this is like a super niche issue, but uh, as just kind of an example of the way this can go wrong, say you're in an organization that has like a self-signed certificate for things on an eternal network. Um, requests has this weird quirk where it doesn't use your system CA bundle to verify TLS. So uh, you might have uh, a custom certificate authority installed to check these things and requests uh, just won't use it. So, um, so the temptation uh, in this example is to do something like just turning off uh, SSL or whatever for certain, um, certain operations. Uh, but instead you can just use um, an environment variable to point to the, your CA bundle. So uh, this is an example where unfortunately the secure thing to do isn't the easiest thing to do. It's kind of a weird edge case, but um, I like this example because it points to an area where you would ideally like to make the secure thing to do just the easiest thing to do, the path of least resistance. Um, anyway, um, you also want to check for precise correct URLs. We live in an age of uh, like typo squatting. Um, you've got uh, two letters switched up and then uh, you end up at the wrong URL um, that is controlled by some attacker. Um, you want to specify the fully qualified domain name if you're doing container image pulls. This is not directly related to Python, but um, a lot of us are going to be working with containers uh, connected to our Python projects. And um, there, there was an old way of doing things where people didn't specify like docker.io slash name of container, and that's um, not good because uh, nowadays uh, there could be multiple registries. The order uh, that registries are queried in could be different, and that uh, is a similar problem to uh, typo squatting. Uh, and Obviously, you want to rely on standard network cryptography and authentication libraries. You don't want to be making your own solutions for these things because there are uh, tested solutions. And if that's not the focus of your project, then there's uh, really no sense in um, creating something that's less tested. Uh, now, 
I want to talk about enforcing best practices on a team project. Um, you want to set expectations for code quality, and some of these things might not seem security related. Uh, the, the issue is that um, code that is uh, following certain best practices and that is consistent across a team is going to be code that's easier to review, uh, and good reviews of code uh, lead to more secure code in the long run. So you, you want to be running unit tests on all, uh, on all merge requests, all pull requests. You want to have unit tests to begin with. Uh, I think I bring that up again later, but it's always good to repeat. Uh, you want to create uh, code coverage or SAS code quality rating thresholds. That's the gating that I was talking about earlier. Um, so um, there's a number of ways to do that. SAS makes it um, pretty easy. Uh, you want to be using code formatters, maybe. Not everyone likes code formatters, but they can, they can help if you want that consistent code style across a whole team for, again, easier code reviews. So if you're going to do something like that, I recommend uh, Black. It's, they call it an opinionated uh, Python formatter. Uh, you may have seen it around. Not everyone likes it because it has very specific ideas of how your code should look, but um, it also takes all the work out of formatting. It just formats. Um, linters like Flake 8 are also good. So maybe you're okay with having a looser format, but you, you want to avoid anything that like the Python peps tell you not to do, for example. Uh, Flake 8 is good for that. Um, and this is really what I said at the beginning of, uh, of this section, but uh, code style can be something of a security issue just because it's easier to be on the same page when you have a consistent style. Um, but back to like these super basic things that you've probably heard a million times already. Um, use Python 3. <laughs> uh, if you've got legacy Python 2 code, uh, I, I know what it's like to have legacy code lying around. Um, there's ways to make it a little bit easier. Uh, there's libraries like Six that you may have used years ago, and maybe you want to pick them up again. <laughs> they're, uh, they're good for bridging that gap as you're moving from Python 2 to Python 3. Obviously, the reason for that is just that Python 3 gets security updates, and Python 2 uh, doesn't get updates anymore. Um, you want to have unit tests, definitely. Um, so many things that you could catch with them uh, that you might not otherwise notice. Um, and it can be incremental. You can have, like, um, you can go from no code tests to, like, uh, I don't know, 10% coverage. And that's better than putting it off until you can reach 80%, right? So uh, if you want to start with just requiring a certain amount of code coverage for new code that's coming in, that's uh, often a great approach uh, that lets you build up coverage over time. And you want it to be meaningful coverage. Uh, you want your test to actually make some kind of sense. But uh, you know, if your test is just running a function, then at least, uh, at least you're catching uh, something catastrophically wrong that prevents your function from running, right? So no, uh, some coverage is better than no coverage. Sorry, go ahead. Um, about requiring uh, coverage for new code, do you have an example of Yeah, so um, the SAS tools that I talked about can apply code coverage metrics to just what's included in a pull request or merge request. So it's not too manual. It's like actually fairly automatic. You can even, um, you know, with I, I'm most experienced with uh, GitLab CI. Um, and if you're integrating those kinds of tools into GitLab CI, you can actually say, you know, throw up a, a badge on something if it doesn't uh, reach that code coverage thresh, threshold, sorry, on just the new code. Uh, so like if, if the new code is beyond 80% covered, then it gets a green badge. If it's like under, then it gets a red badge. And the code reviewer says, hey, uh, it's, not, it's not ready yet. Um, so that can be super helpful. It doesn't have to be manual. It can be uh, easier if you have the right automation in place. Um, 
Thank you, that was a good question. Uh, using established libraries for cryptography is super important. I think I already said it, but like, again, don't roll your own crypto, as they say, um, but also don't make your own SQL requests. These are maybe obvious things, but like, uh, maybe you're coding fast and you uh, start to get into these habits of reinventing the wheel. Uh, so don't. Uh, there's great libraries for hand handling SQL. If you're doing SQL and HTTP requests and stuff, you probably want to have like a good framework. You probably want to have, you know, whether it's something as big as Django or something lighter, <laughs> maybe you maybe you just need a Flask or something. But you you uh, probably don't want to. Uh, go into this territory where people have already done the work of doing these things securely uh, and uh, just kind of like forge ahead. Uh, instead, you've, uh, you've got community supported projects to lean on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end now. If anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear them. Hey. Yeah, that's. I think that's mainly what pip sync is uh, is for. Is you can you can run that periodically, and it can help you. Um, it can help you upgrade things. You can uh, or. Um, I've. It's been a. It's been a while since I I tinkered with pip sync, but like pip compile itself also, you can run it again. You can. Um, it will regenerate um, things, and there's different settings you can run. So you could basically wipe out your requirements.txt and rerun uh, pip compile on the requirements.in, uh, but uh, you don't have to do it that drastically. You can do just like, I, I don't remember all the options, but you can do just portions of your um, dependencies that you, you pull in the newer versions. Um, I think you can target like, oh, I want to upgrade this dependency and run pip compile that way and just say like, upgrade that one, the rest of them are fine. So there is like uh, some customizability there. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, poetry. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, as we're at uh, this particular conference, uh, are you aware of a way to uh, uh, make poetry install just uh, the project you're uh, in, uh, like the, the one you downloaded and want to work with? For, for I, say, using I have to be totally honest. I have like very much no experience with like these okay. comprehensive systems like Poetry or Hatch. Yeah. They were recommended to me, but personally, I've been using the approach of using all these other like individual tools to focus on the individual problems instead of like the all-encompassing thing. I suspect this could actually be a topic for a whole conference. Yeah, I. I'm sorry I don't have the answer, but I if you if you give a talk like that I will attend it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to do that. Long, so it's, it's a long time. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm not super sure about the like provenance of the security linting within uh, SonarCube, for example. Like, I think there might be some in-house stuff going on there. But, um, but you know, if you're not running something like uh, SonarCube that's already going to do security linting for you, uh, you can run Bandit as a as a standalone thing. Uh, any other questions? Thank you all for coming, especially those of you who are here live in the room uh, on, in the middle of a Sunday. Thank you. <laughs>